it's it's a real pleasure to be presenting the work on behalf of uh, the COVID Multiomic Blood Atlas Consortium um, that, that was led out of Oxford and has involved many colleagues, some of whom may well be on the call, and a huge thank you to everyone involved. It, it's a great privilege to, to speak, speak today. Um, obviously, this project depended on uh, patient and healthy volunteer involvement, so the work of the Center for Personalized Medicine in, in promoting and disseminating the science um, that, that's only possible through that sort of involvement is really critical. And I'd just also like to highlight the fact that I'm going to show you a lot of different multiomic data sets based on um, next generation sequencing, which was all done um, through the Oxford Genomic Center. And huge thanks to David Paolo, um, and a huge number of others within the team for making that possible. So we, we established um, the, the COMBAT project, as Simon says, right at the outset of the pandemic. So the patients I'm going to be describing to you um, have, have, have not been vaccinated. Um, a relatively small proportion of them were getting um, high dose steroid therapy, which became standard practice for the more severely ill patients. So in a way, it's a snapshot of the disease in its rawest um, when we had very few effective inter inter interventions. And we were motivated by the desire to understand why some people became very unwell. Um, and the, the increasingly recognized heterogeneity that existed within patients that were admitted to hospital in terms of the different complications that might arise. And the hope that by doing deep phenotyping um, in the accessible tissue samples, we could move this forward. It became clear that logistically, it was really only practical to focus on the blood. Um, and I, I say that because I think there's still an awful lot to learn from samples as we increasingly are able to obtain them um, from lung and other specific um, tissues. So what I think we've been able to do here is get a picture in the blood of um, different correlates and markers of severity, an idea of the underlying mechanisms um, and hypotheses that can then be tested in the lab, and some insights into how we might begin to stratify patients as they present um, so that we can target treatments more effectively. I'm going to be describing to you um, quite a complex set of, of patients, but essentially we had a group of inpatients hospitalized with acute COVID-19 of different severities. Um, and what we're using here as our baseline is a WHO severity scoring based on the, the level of respiratory support that patients were needing, which allowed you to define patients with more mild, severe and critical illness among the hospitalized cases. And then we had a cohort of patients with COVID-19 that were never admitted to hospital, so they had more mild disease. And from the outset, we wanted to start to understand what might be different in these patients compared with other severe infections. And the groups we were comparing with were all cause sepsis pre-COVID-19 from material that we had stored down. And similarly, um, from patients who were severely unwell with influenza. And we, we, we also included age and sex matched healthy controls. This was highly collaborative, over 120 researchers involved from a number of different institutes. And it was fantastic that sharing of expertise and hopefully there's a legacy for that in terms of some of the pipelines and understanding that, that have been generated as a result of this that we can apply to other, other diseases. So this cartoon gives you an idea of the, the range of omic approaches that we were using together with really in-depth um, immunology. Um, so there was data arising from mass cytometry, which gives you single cell level information on um, the cellular composition in the blood using um, protein markers. We looked in whole blood at transcriptomics using total RNA sequencing. And then we had a lot of effort around single cell um, omics using the, the SiteSeq platform or approach from 10x genomics, which gives you information on single cell RNA abundance, together with um, over 100 different um, cell surface proteins and information on the B and T cell repertoire. We had some limited data generated 
um, on epigenetics in terms of single cell ATAC seq. And then we had two methods for looking at the plasma proteins. And all of this we tried to bring together, and I'll spend probably the majority of the talk talking about that because I think, you know, in terms of the relevance across other, other, other um, programs of work, that's perhaps most interesting. All of this is available um, as a preprint um, on Med Archive. And I'm really only going to scratch the surface of the data today. So if you're interested and haven't already seen it, um, you might want to have a look at that preprint. So um, first of all, just very briefly to show you the sort of insights you can get from the, 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 the whole blood total RNA sequencing. Um, and the, a significant team of people involved here, particular input um, and leadership from Katie Burnham and Alex Menser and Andrew Kwok. And if you take that expression data and you look at the variance within it and the components of variance um, that describe that data, the majority of the variance is described by the first principal component, about 40%, and then we have the second principal component. And if you then look at our different um, groups of individuals, you can see that there's a climb going from our healthy and community cases, different COVID severities, and out into the sepsis, all cause sepsis patients. And I think this just begins to show you how you can achieve some stratification within the patients in terms of etiology and severity from this relatively simple measure in, in whole peripheral blood, looking at the most variable genes. And if, if we then restrict that to the hospitalized cases of, of COVID-19 um, and look at that variance in the gene expression, again, you see this very clear relationship um, such that there was a very strong um, association um, among the hospitalized cases with the first principal component for the 28 day mortality. And the genes that are contributing to that first principal component are perhaps not a surprise when we look at the sort of process there's, they're involved with. So um, neutrophil degranulation, um, evidence consistent with lymphocyte exhaustion, antimicrobial peptides and clotting cascade. And what's perhaps intriguing from, from this data is then saying, well, people have speculated a lot about um, the role of interferons, and indeed they come up, but quite distinctly and related more to the second principal component of variance, which is, is less clearly related to um, severity. And I think this probably reflects more the fact that it's very dependent on the stage of the illness in which the interferons are really playing a role and where you're picking them up. Um, so this just gives a little bit more of a, a sense of the data. I mean, there's vast numbers of differentially expressed genes when we compare mild and critically ill patients with COVID-19. And here are some of the, the differentially um, expressed genes um, in terms of the particular pathways. So to introduce a couple of the other techniques, um, Giorgio and the team um, generated really great data from using mass cytometry, which gives us a, an, an ultra high resolution view of the cellular composition. And this just gives you a flavor of the sort of changes in, in cell composition at a very high level that we saw um, looking across some of these different groups. Um, and we were then able to drill in, in, in detail to those. And another method that we had for looking at cellular composition um, was, was using the SiteSeq data um, with work led through um, Kali Dendru and Steve Sampson and a huge number of others, where we could start to combine the information that we got at, from these different individual modalities um, to really identify not only the major cell populations and subtypes and then particular clusters to say that cells with a particular signature of gene expression and protein abundance reflecting their underlying biology might be particularly important in terms of, of um, understanding the, the disease heterogeneity. So over on the right hand side here, I'm just giving you an idea of that. And this is a plot that Kelly had generated, looking at some of the clinical, clinical covariates and the association of some um, specific cell, cell populations um, with those. And there were some very interesting things coming up with um, the platelet and CD34 progenitor cell populations, which we're abbreviating to PLT here, and some specific classical monocyte um, subtypes. 
that just shows you the sort of picture you can get when you get to this really high level of resolution. Um, and it gets, you know, hard to manage this, this sort of level of complexity, but essentially within the, the, the monocyte population, you can start to think about how they vary in terms of classical definitions of, of monocytes, levels of HLA expression, and so on. Um, and similarly across the, the lymphocyte population. So this gives you an idea of comparing healthy volunteers with either the mild, severe, or critical COVID, the community cases, and some convalescent samples that we had, and then what might be shared or indeed distinct when we start to compare the COVID with sepsis in this particular example. So this is the sort of um, resolution we're getting from the site off data. And then with the site seek, we found very good concordance in terms of calling of cell populations, um, but it, does, it is a slightly different resolution that we're, we're achieving here um, in terms of really um, more, uh, perhaps a more functional um, annotation that we can apply to the different cell populations and what might be uh, distinct or different. And just briefly, this is showing you within the classical monocytes, which seem to be um, particularly interesting in terms of their differences in, in abundance um, between the more critically ill patients. How, um, if we look at um, the, the clustering of, 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 of these cells and the expression of some particularly interesting markers, um, then there are quite pronounced differences in the abundance, for example, of HLA-DR, which is a, an important class two um, HLA molecule and CD33, when we start to go across from healthy into mild, severe, and more critical cases. And then what's happening in the community um, and what might be shared or distinct from, from sepsis. So I'm just giving you a flavor of the data here um, and the ways that we're still, and I hope others will continue to mine this data to really maximize its, its value. And to briefly introduce the mass spectrometry data generated by Roman and colleagues. So this was looking in the plasma um, and getting accurate quantification for over 100 proteins. Um, and again, this is a principal component plot showing you this variation in, in the abundance of these plasma proteins and how there are very clear differences as we, as we go across from the healthy and mild cases into severe and more critically ill and, and sepsis patients. And we were able to apply this method to a larger number of cases, which is why you're seeing many more community cases uh, in, in this particular plot. And again, this allows us to start to, to understand what are the signatures that we can get from the, from the, the peripheral plasma protein abundances. Um, and some of these are very strongly um, differential as we, in terms of the particular proteins that contribute to that first principal component, including um, widely used uh, clinical biomarkers such as C-reactive protein. Um, and this is um, data from Luzeng um, and the team where rather than using mass spectrometry, they use the Luminex immunoassay, which allows you to look at the smaller proteins such as cytokines that you can't um, pick up from, from that data. So if you look in plasma uh, from sepsis patients versus COVID using mass spectrometry, we can get a picture of some of the differentially expressed proteins specifically between all cause sepsis and COVID-19. And this is um, some of the Luminex data for, for particularly interesting and important cytokines that were differentially expressed, including some of which are in active clinical trials or indeed therapies based on IL-6 or GMCSF. And here's calprotectin, uh, which has been widely proposed as a biomarker. So um, bringing all this data together then is, is one of the real challenges. So with machine learning, um, we can start to do that. So Fabian Ruhl and Matt Jackson um, have successfully applied this to the two different types of plasma protein assay and the whole blood RNA sequencing and seeing what, what would be informative, you know, in terms of discriminating severe patients um, based on, on that using a training and a validation set. And one way to reduce the vast amount of information, you know, we're looking at many th thousands of um, different uh, differentially expressed genes is to go back to the principal components and see which of the principal components are maximally informative for discriminating um, severity. 
and that's dominated by the, the components from the plasma proteins rather than from the RNA sequencing gene expression. And if you then extract the features from these and do a feature illumination um, process, what, what Fabian found was that these particular plasma proteins um, were performing best with an approximately 75% uh, predictive accuracy. Um, and again, it, 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 these will be familiar to many of you, but it's the combination um, that is most discriminatory here rather than measuring a single um, marker. And clearly this needs validation in larger data sets. Now, um, the final thing I wanted to introduce you to was this idea of tensor decomposition. Um, and this takes a little bit of getting your head around. Um, and all credit to Justin Wally, um, who, who led on this work um, together with Heather, Steve, and, and Anna. And what we were trying to do here was to take all of our available multiomic and immu immunology data and try to combine it and understand what the, the drivers of differences might be. So we were able, with our gene expression data, to think about this on an individual sample basis where we have levels of expression, but also we can distinguish that by cell type because of the sort of single cell data I've just shown you. And that generates a three-dimensional tensor, whereas for the other modalities, we were looking at a two-dimensional matrix. For example, our plasma proteins, we had individual samples and we had levels of those proteins, but we weren't discriminating it into a, a third dimension. And that was all combined and, and decomposed using this um, algorithm that had been previously published and um, with some adaption, being able to pull out the latent components of variants, a bit like that principal component analysis I was showing you earlier, but where the, the, the contribution by different data types across all of our different modalities could be linked. So we could get information on what might be a particular important, particularly formative cell population, plasma protein, and expression of a particular gene that might together um, be distinguishing our cases. And I'll show you a couple of examples of this. So this was the um, component of variance, the latent component of variance that was most um, discriminatory for COVID-19 severity. So we identified just over 300 of these latent components, and this is component 171. And here is the different loading scores for our comparator groups. So you can see the healthy and the community cases are down here for this particular component. Whereas for COVID, we're going from mild to severe to critical in these three different colors. And the patients are being very clearly distinguished by this particular component with our sepsis and um, flu patients sitting somewhere in the middle. So what is it about this component that's allowing us to distinguish these three groups? Well, in terms of the cell populations, what was contributing most to the loading score involved these intermediate monocyte cells, a particular type of plasma blast, and these HLA low, CD33 low classical monocytes. And you can start to see that individual data here as um, we have progressively less of these intermediate monocytes and progressively more of the classical um, HLA-DR low monocytes. These are the plasma proteins that we're contributing, some of which I showed you earlier in that um, machine learning approach. But remember here, the full data set is available to the algorithm that then pulls out this particular um, com combination that are within this individual component. And these are um, what was coming out in terms of gene expression. Um, so we're linking these changes in the monocyte population, these particular plasma proteins with genes that are involved particularly in antigen presentation and TCR signaling. So it's intriguing, it's, it, it's generating hypotheses. And what I think is interesting is it's linking these individual, if you like, biomarkers with something that might be mechanistic. Um, and the, 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 the final component I just wanted to flag was one that seemed to discriminate our COVID-19 cases from our healthy flu and sepsis. And what's interesting here is our community cases are very high for this particular component in terms of the loading score. And it's not really distinguishing on, in terms of severity, 
And this is involving a number of key stress and activation response genes. Um, but what particularly stood out were these um, activator protein one components, FOS and Jun. And there was other evidence that we pulled out from um, the combat project that, that supported a potential role for these transcription factors um, in some way that might be specific to COVID-19. So this is looking at the accessible chromatin using ATAC-seq. These are the particular transcription factor motifs that were very significantly enriched when we look in, looked in the COVID patients. And right at the top, you can see FOS and Jun coming up. So this is very independent way of getting at these particular transcription factors. And when um, Fabiola, Lucy, Charlotte, and Steve looked at the single cell gene expression in terms of modules, there was a clear module that stood out um, with enrichment again for these AP1 transcription factors, very different when you looked in the healthy volunteers for the COVID groups and community, including the community group um, versus what we saw in the flu and sepsis. Um, and this is expression of the, the, what we call the eigen gene that represents that particular gene module. Again, very different across all these cell populations um, for this particular module. So um, that's the end of the data. I'm aware I've taken this, you through this really quickly. I'm hoping there might be a couple of minutes for, for questions. Um, in the paper, we summarize across all these different cell populations and mechanisms, what might be hallmarks of COVID-19, and similarly, um, what might be very specific or, or uh, indeed shared with um, severe sepsis. And there isn't the time to go through this with you today, but it's just to flag up the ways that we're trying to bring this together and in this case for flu versus COVID-19. So it just remains to, to thank the huge numbers of, of people in, involved, a real pleasure to work with, with everyone and um, look forward to this, these data sets continuing to be used and, and helpful. And we're, we're in the process of making them all publicly accessible. Thank you.